Well, thanks very much to Taryn for that a brilliant introduction or setting the scene in a global and then a more, you know, sort of product-based context. Um, well, I want to sort of start off by introducing what we now have. is a, is a great panel of speakers here to discuss some of the issues raised by Taryn. So we're going to, what I'm going to do is give a little intro to each of these speakers, uh, a chance to introduce themselves, talk about the big issues they think about, and then we'll address the issues raised by that talk individually. So we'll start off with retirement, pension savings, then we'll move on to mortgages. And then I'm going to very loosely interpret technology as sort of long-term care. There are big data, data issues there as well. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do uh, pensions and mortgages in there. So if I could introduce, uh, we've got on the far end of the panel, it's uh, Andrew Dilnot. Um, he was a, a short sort of snapshot of his career. He was director of the Institute of Fiscal Studies. So this was our ne nemesis. I, when I was at the National Institute, um, way, way back, the IFS was just the, 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 the place to be. And I remember in those years, I used to listen to Andrew's uh, analysis programs. And I still think he remains the best if, um, presenter ever on the analysis programs. He then went on to, then you moved on to St. Hugh's College. Uh, and in Oxford and became Pro Vice Chancellor in 2002, and uh, then in uh, 2012 became Warden of Nuffield College. But while you were there, you, were, um, you sat on or you chaired the Commission on Long-Term Care. So we're going to give Andrew the floor when we come to talk about long-term care very much there. Uh, and then since 2011, after when that finished, Andrew was uh, chair of the uh, Statistics Commission here uh, in the UK, the National Statistics Authority, sorry. Uh, and now you're returning back to academia in some sense to think about some big issues. Right, so. Then uh, I've got, in the middle, we've got Roger. Roger is the Managing Director of Retirement and Equity Lease uh, Products at Aviva. <laughs> As we all know, Aviva is the largest provider of health and insurance products and pension products in the UK. Hmm. Not savings products. I know you're the, I, know, I didn't say savings. <laughs> I know you're the biggest asset manager. <laughs> uh, started well. <laughs> That's good. Um, so Roger was an economics graduate, uh, I had a, a, laugh, a chartered accountant. Uh, worked at Deloitte's and Barclays Capital before moving to Aviva and has run the retirement solutions, retirement income, and now the equity lease uh, products before trying to unite them, I think, in a, in a big group. And finally, we've got Nigel Wilson, CEO of Legal & General, who, from my information, Legal & General is the second largest asset manager in Europe after BlackRock. Yeah. Nigel got a, a PhD from MIT. You were the Kennedy Scholar, uh, the Alfred, Slo uh, Sloan, uh, sorry, Alfred Sloan Scholar and the Kennedy Scholar at MIT. You held many, many posts since then, McKinsey's, Dixon's, Capita, and you were chairman of the Halfords Group uh, before moving to LNG. You were voted City Business Personality of the Year. I think we hope we're going to see some of that in 2014. And I also believe you're no slouch on the, uh, the, the running track around 800 meters uh, compared. Um, so that's our panelist today. Now, to introduce, sort of introduce some of the points that we want to do at. Uh, the big thing that's going on in the last 35 years, it's been pointed out, is the sort of disintermediation of risk to households. Households are bearing more and more risk in, in, uh, as we move on. And the two big examples we're going to focus on is pensions, where we've seen a move from DB schemes, defined benefit schemes, where, uh, if you like, pension was given a, a fixed income, to more DC schemes, where now households are bearing that risk. Also, we saw it in healthcare, where we get into intermediation there, but that's more from the public sector. Now, uh, you know, households are taking more and more of that risk themselves, having to fund long-term care themselves, and especially, as Tawan mentioned, the aging population that's becoming a bigger and bigger issue. They're doing this in a world that's becoming more and more complex. There are more and more solutions out there in terms of insurance projects, mortgages, pensions, than they can invest in. It's a bewildering array. 
the last count, there were over 80,000 mutual saving products in the world, 3,000 based in the UK. So this is just a massive problem for households and leaves them rather at um, you know, a loose end. And in one of my favorite articles by Robert Merton in 2003, he addressed this problem. Robert Merton, probably the smartest financial economist ever. And here's a quote. I see us going in the direction of more integrated financial products, products that are easy to understand, are tailored to individual profiles, and permit much more effective risk collection and control than we have ever had. Unlike current practice, the integrated financial service business of the future is going to focus on the customer rather than the product. Anyway, I think that quote is even more valid today than it was in the past. And that's the kind of what the question that we are going to address. So now I'm going to ask my panelists to just you know, take two minutes or so to introduce themselves, to outline what they think are bigger challenges before we address each of those three issues in turn. Thank you. Andrew, would you like to start? Yeah. Uh, well, let me be very brief because it's late in the day. Um, i just say two things that I think of as being the background to much of what I've thought about all of this. The first is that there is just much more household wealth than there used to be. The, 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 the very uh, extremely interesting stuff that Taron put up, it, that was in levels. Didn't tell us what's happened to, the, happened to those levels over time. In the UK, which is where I know best, the ratio of household wealth to, to GDP has roughly trebled in the last few decades at a time when GDP in real terms has itself trebled. So we've got a, a, an increase of you know, seven, eight, nine in the, in the level of real household wealth. So there's a huge stock of wealth, and for many of the households that are now trying to manage that, that's a relatively new experience. The generation before them didn't have that experience, and so that's why I think there's a great deal of learning to be done. So that's, that's one important point. I think the second thing to recognize is that people don't just want wealth so that they can consume in the future. They're using wealth as a form of self-insurance. So risk pooling is the absolutely key issue for a large part of the sets of decisions the household's got to make. In countries like the UK, there's a lot of risk pooling done by the state through the health system, through the social security system. One of the really interesting challenges for financial services, and I know James is going to get me, give me a chance to talk about this later on, is um, that there are some areas where households want risk pooling, where the private sector is not going to do it. The private sector doesn't anywhere in the world, for example, offer pre-funded insurance of long-term care. And it does that for the very good reason that if it did, it would go bankrupt, or might go bankrupt, because that kind of long way out risk, there's uh, what might be called radical uncertainty. We just don't know what might come along. There's a real chance of an aggregate shock here, and so there's a missing market for households that between them, in most countries, neither the state nor the private sector financial service industry is meeting, and one of the big challenges, which is a kind of technology challenge for the next few years, I think, is trying to work out how we might meet that very large demand, the demand that at the moment is being met either by people crossing their fingers, shutting their eyes and hoping it doesn't happen to them, or by trying to self-insure in a way that is extraordinarily inefficient. Roger, thanks. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, I guess best qualification, having elderly parents and a 19-year-old and a 15-year-old uh, child, family finances and the intergenerational nature uh, of, of what we're facing is, is very much in focus for me. So uh, when we talk about pension provision, mortgages and social care, three massive areas and it, and it really is the both the fairness but also the way that the, the, the generations work together to help try and solve those particular problems and I think as we go through all of this there are no silver kind of bullet uh, solutions to any of this stuff um, there are very different cohorts we probably have some short-term medium-term and longer-term uh, kind of approaches to, to, to funding um, and I think really the, you know, the, the, the point around the, the, the kind of the housing wealth being the largest asset at the moment in the, in the kind of short to, to medium term, um, you know, there's, there's, there's approximately two and a half trillion pounds worth of, of equity uh, owned by the over 55. So for, for a lot of, a lot of uh, people, that is, that is the place to go. Um, and I think the other piece that we'll probably come to is when we talk about um, how uh, we, we, we get individuals to look forward and make sure they have enough provision for uh, social care. 
I think the absolute kind of important point there for, for everybody is understanding the actual personal liability and almost the contract with the state and local authority so that actually it, we can actually get to the point where people understand what their, what their responsibilities are and then can actually engage and, and, and try and work out how to make provision for that. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I'm Nigel Wilson. A, um, in terms of legal and just to parameterise some of the, uh, the data, we look after about a trillion pounds. The average fees we charge on that is 0.08%. That's a, a basis point. Our cost structure is about 0.04%, which is about four basis, four basis points. So huge economies of scale in these industries, which we didn't have 15 or 20 uh, years ago, when we used to look after about 30 billion of funds under management. We originate about 65 billion of mortgages with the fastest growing housing supplier in the UK. Uh, and we're also competing head to head with Aviva in this very attractive new market opportunity in lifetime mortgages, recognizing the two and a half trillion of housing wealth which can be redeployed. I think the, the points that Andrew is making is there's just been an, an enormous amount of market failures for all sorts of different reasons. And I was really struck by the, the last point on the last slide, which is what we do need to see is positive, constructive collaboration between academia, policy makers, and business. And for the first time in my working life, we're beginning to see that in many different levels so that we can truly solve these e enormous market failures. You know, we've undersupplied the housing market for 20 or 30 years right now. People don't understand retirement savings whatsoever. We look after about 90% of the, um, the trillion is invested in pension of one form or another. These huge demographic time bombs are happening. We've all got it at a family level. Now it's become very personal to all of us. We've all got very interested in solving these uh, huge macroeconomic problems that we, that we have as a, as, a, as, a, as a country. And in many ways, we've got some of the better solutions in the world. Lots of other parts of the world haven't got solutions whatsoever, but they, one thing's for certain, they're not going to adopt the same solutions that we've had here in the uh, UK. Part of the solution is absolutely through housing wealth. We've had a very intergenerationally unfair society for the last 30, 30 or 40 years. My generation has been the most selfish generation uh, of all. You know, housing has cost me nothing over my whole life. I've made an enormous amount of money out of housing. I have no housing assets at the moment other than my children because I acted as the bank of mum and dad. Bank of mum and dad has now become the seventh or eighth largest mortgage lender in the UK. Uh, and four of my <laughs> children now uh, um, on very, very nice and attractive flats in, uh, in London while I'm, whilst I'm renting. And it's a sort of peculiar change around, but it's, it's what's optimal for me is not necessarily optimal for them. But I'm addressing a market failure in that they would never be able to afford uh, uh, the houses in which they live in. Um, my wife was largely financially illiterate, and my children are financially cunning beyond belief. So we've seen a massive amount of, uh, one of whom was uh, educated here at Imperial, and she's the most cunning of all. Uh, she lives in a two-bedroom apartment in Kensington, uh, which uh, was meant to be a one-bedroom flat in Hammersmith, but something got lost in translation between myself, my wife, and my very clever daughter. Um, and, but... There are really serious issues that we've got to solve as a nation, and, and uh, you know, retirement savings, which is a hu huge one, I think market failure in payday lending and areas like that, which we're trying to address at the same time. And business, again, for the first time really in my life, is trying to address these huge market failures as it's become very personal to us, whether it's our, mm. our grandparents, our parents, or children, because the market's got so distorted. And as Andrew rightly pointed out, there isn't a market for long-term care. The reason there isn't a market for long-term care, it's too expensive at the moment. Yes, yes, we could price it, but nobody would buy it because we can't pool enough of the risk. And some risk is societal risk. And L and G, which started in the coffee houses of, of London in 1836, pooling legal risk, that's where legal in general actually came, came from. We need to figure out new mechanisms for pooling of risk in, at a society level, which benefit everyone in society. And we've done a poor job as a, as a society in doing that for the last 30 years. Hence, the housing problem, the retirement problem, the long-term care problem, that we, and the intergenerational unfairness problem that we've got to address going forward. Okay, well, that was fantastic. That was, uh, you know, introducing the big issues. So, just don't let my kids hear. <laughs> and I've got five kids. The idea that I've got to provide five homes to keep up. Yeah, no, I think I'm going out to get another job tomorrow. Um, 
Right, so we've got, we got this uh, these introduction here. So we're going to now approach each of the uh, subjects that in more detail. That Taren, so we'll start with uh, pensions. Now, Taryn put some figures up there about the whatever called the retirement savings gap in the UK. I mean, the figures I've got are from the World Economic Forum, where it was estimated that the UK is in one of the worst situations in the, in the development world with if you like, a gap of retirement savings of 25 trillion, so 25 trillion more savings needed to be able to sustain con uh, consumption at the 70% level that they uh, received during their working lives. And part of the problem uh, is, you know, for people saving us, they just don't know. The, the, the policy, the economic environment has been so changing over the last few years. We've had so many changes. Maybe we'll talk about where you've got auto-enrollment, you've got pension freedoms and so on coming in just recently, and that was after the major changes in the early 2000s. So we're going to talk about it a bit now. now. I'm going to first ask Nigel a question and say, uh, very, very generally, to get the conversation going. Um, now, Legal in general are, are very, very big in the, in the pension market uh, and the annuity market. Do you think the market, the current market as it stands, is serving households well? Or do you think the products don't really address the needs of the households? Well, I think the products, as they sit today, are, are in pretty good shape. I mean, auto enrollment's been a huge success. Uh, it's 92% opt-in rates, which is 30% uh, higher than any of the consultants. But not contributing very much, though. Um, uh, yeah, I, it's, it's contributes. You know, I mean, I, th I think it's 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 the direction of travel and the policy introduction. I think has been first rate. And, and you know, to be fair to Steve Webb and the other ministers yeah. who did it, it's very good. We had a, a price cap introduced, which uh, is de deeply impossible, uh, unpopular, but it was the right thing to do. I personally think the price cap was set way too high, and that we should use technology to drive down prices even further to the benefit of of customers. And People have to recognise that they thought of their house as part of their pension. You know, my mum, you know, my, my aunties, my uncles, and whatever. But when they get to retire, they stop thinking like that. And therefore, we've created a situation where um, there's an enormous amount of housing wealth, and it's not been monetized efficiently, and the markets have yet to fully develop products which, are, which will allow the pooling of risk and the monetization of housing wealth to create better products for people going forward. And that goes back to the point I made earlier. That's about positive constructive collaboration between academics, the policy makers, and business and finance. Until we have that, we'll have three different types of solutions in a very inefficient uh, market. And I would like the, each of those bodies to kind of step up and the politicians stop you know, going after bankers and, and financiers all, all of the time, the business people not engaging in policy or policy at, 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 at all and customers having no advice because regulations made advice virtually impossible for <coughs> ourselves and Aviva to, to give any, any more because the, the costs of it have become way too mm. high relative to the benefits and the risks that the resources so the mean, markets have not been developed. I mean, you, you mentioned auto enrollment. I mean, when auto enrollment was set up, there was a massive discussion before that about what would be the default fund, as you know, yeah. And in the end, it was decided to make the default fund a sort of target-dated fund, really, with 60 different target date retirement dates, uh, to try and simplify the, the retirement decisions of households. So you just put, decide when you're going to retire, you like to retire, you put your money in, and the allocation is done for you. It's very hard in the UK to find similar, similar type products. In the, in the private sector. I mean, the, the amount invested in target aid funds is very, very tiny. So this is the sort of simplification that, you know, households are looking for in terms of the retirement decision. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we look after about 200 billion in the United States as well. I have a whole series yeah. of target aid funds uh, over there. We're very happy with the product offering that we've got at the moment in the UK. And the default funds, we like the default funds to have a wider remit from the policymakers than they've got their economy goals and be allowed to invest more in direct investment, real assets, venture capital, and a whole bunch of things mm -hmm. that they're, from a policy point of view, precluded from investing at the moment, which we think will lead to better societal uh, outcomes. Because just going back to technology and behavioral economics, if, if there's five boxes on the front pa page of, and the, the middle one is the default fund, about 80 or 90% of the people just tick the middle, mm -hmm. middle box. And in America, you know, one of my friends who got the Nobel Prize for, for economics, you know, he ticked a box when he joined the university 30 years ago, and he hasn't changed <laughs> since. <laughs> since. And, it, you know, and he's written a lot of stuff on rational expectations. So um, the, 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 
which may apply to at a, at a, at a higher level. But there's lots of things that need changing. But I, I think the direction of travel is a very good one, and we would encourage the policymakers not to keep changing in such a big way. There's been, you know, maybe a, a thousand minor, um, minor major changes um, in pension reform in the last seven or eight years, and it just, you know, when you're building these large models and, and business platforms, it's an mm -hmm. enormous cost to Aviva and ourselves. Yeah, that's what, I, yeah, that's what I want to pick, pick up really and, and take that point. And Roger, mm. you were involved in the discussion about pension freedoms. I mean, that was a big change. It was called the biggest change in the yeah. generation. I mean, in some ways that changed the market overnight mm. in the way that people saved and allowing them a great deal more freedom, but also there was fears that it killed the annuity market mm. and very much reduced people's, you know, they run down their savings too quickly. I mean, what's your view on that? I mean, in, in terms of generally freedoms to, you know, do what, what is best suited for you uh, in terms of your finance, I think as a, as a theory, um, you know, it, I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of that. I think uh, it had a few different impacts. So I think uh, saying I was involved in the discussions, actually, I had to implement it, which is subtly different. <laughs> but uh, um, so, I mean, we did see some initial... Um, kind of, you know, the headlines, the, the going by Lamborghini headlines. Actually, we saw a lot more rational um, interactions with our customers than you might expect, or the headlines actually came out. So we have probably had more people who were concerned about not blowing it than people who were kind of going off. So I, I think the initial, it's too early to tell. I mean, it was still relatively early. So we did see a lot of the relatively small pots kind of going out the door, which actually... Uh, you know, if people are doing things like clearing uh, credit card debt or actually get themselves into bed, it's not necessarily a, a bad thing. So um, I think a knock-on effect is what it has done is it's brought the uh, pension provision slightly more forward in people's minds. So at the very least, it is, it is starting the, the, the dialogue in terms of seeing what people are going through now in pension freedoms. So for the younger generations, there is potentially the, the kind of, you know, the engagement uh, uh, hook into that. And from an, I mean, from an annuity perspective, um, you know, we are still seeing a, a you know, uh, a recovery. But I think, and, and this comes back to some of the points that were made um, previously around, we're not talking about products anymore. We're talking about actually what is a customer and their family is more importantly trying to achieve over the next 30 or 40 years. Retirement's not a single point in time. And actually, you know, your, your requirements over that period change. It's a, it's a case of looking at your entire assets and liabilities and working out what can come in when to, to kind of help out in that. So I think the point on the removal of guidance at the time of giving people who suddenly weren't any more switched on more choice was a, a, a rather difficult uh, point to get through. So, so we see annuities and, you know, perhaps we need to obviously the, change the name because the narrative in the newspapers, et cetera, is annuity is a bad word. But if you talk to customers as, as we do and talk through, what are you actually trying to achieve? Well, actually, for a proportion of their funds, they're actually trying to guarantee income for life because they are most concerned about covering everyday living expenses that, you know, uh, and, and then perhaps a blend with some of the drawdowns. So it, it's a, you know, there are no hard conclusions drawn yet, but we see a fair bit of rational uh, behaviour. But, I mean, back to, back to your point, the, the inability to help people through it um, is and frustrating. That, and, and that will move us nicely on. Um, if you have a question, a question or whatever about pensions that you would like to address, then fine, raise your hand. Otherwise, because of time and everything, I want to move straight on to sort of mortgage policy and address, uh, think about equity release. Do I have a question? Oh, yes, great. Do we have a question? Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, the comments made that you're seeing quite a lot of uh, rational thought about pensions uh, as people uh, approach retirement. But there's at least uh, three things which I'd say that as much as you might be seeing rational discussions, as uh, Taryn outlined, the, uh, the issues which have to be solved for somebody as they approach drawdowns um, are extremely complex. And households have enough trouble uh, figuring out a PCP uh, arrangement for car leasing. So, the information formats households are not um, designed to answer these questions. And you say, uh, we're in a situation where we don't have enough evidence yet, but we do have evidence. In Australia, for example, we're finding that uh, people, uh, they've got a drawdown system running there for some amount of years. And Australia is looking at reinstituting 
some element of um, annuity formats because people are running out of pension funds before they actually die. And furthermore, there was just a report... Sorry, can we have uh, a question, please? Uh, well, <laughs> my, my, my question is, I think... Uh, my, my, my question is, how can we be assured that the household's not being sold a pup in the drawdown format because they cannot answer these questions? OK, now, do you want to say that? Yeah, I think the, you know, this thing about the moral hazards being created by the Australian president is actually very good for the, for the U UK and that annuities do serve a purpose mm -hmm. and have a role to play. You know, we went from zero to... 100% to zero overnight, and it's been, a, a diff and it's been a wider discussion. We were involved in that discussion, and I personally was involved in that discussion, but the Chancellor wanted to make a specific uh, decision around it. Um, will technology and artificial intelligence solve a lot of these problems? I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, and will they solve it economically? The answer to that is also yes. And can the the human advice component complement that, that's also yes. Are we able to do that at the moment because of policy? The answer to that is no. Um, is the industry selling pups? I don't think the industry is selling too many pups uh, ar around that. I you know, I don't think Viva sells pups or the Peru or ourselves sell pup products. There, there is a, such a, a good social consciousness around all, all, of, all of this at the moment to not sell pups. Because um, it, you know, we have huge, these are huge suppliers of financial services, and this is just one component of it. In 20 years' time, could some of these many thousands of products be seen as pups? Yes, but there's a, there's a large amount of anal analytics that's going on, not just by industry experts, but also by academics, to, to try and identify these sorts of uh, situations. But in any capitalist economy, there will be some market failure situations arise around that. But I, but I don't see too many poor, really poor products at the moment. OK. Um, well, thank you. Very much. If we move on, on to, yeah, we're again, keeping an eye on time, the mortgage market. And I particularly wanted to focus on the equity release, because this is a very exciting new market. Mm. It's pretty young in the UK. Um, but it's expanding, and mm. Aviva was in the market, you're the incumbent, if you like, mm. and then I know Santander and LNG are now into this market. Uh, because that, if you could just keep your remarks really sort of quick and precise, but yes, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Of, of course. So, you know, uh, rapidly growing market, so 40% uh, increase last year, so just over £3 billion. Uh, we've actually been in since 1998, which was kind of relatively early uh, in the UK. Um, but again, back to the point of only scratching the surface in terms of the amount of housing wealth there. What, what, what we have seen, uh, keeping this brief, yeah. um, over the last few years is, is a real change in terms of how we're seeing um, equity release and the wider use of housing uh, wealth, whether it be downsizing or, or through equity release. Uh, we're actually seeing a, a bigger change in uses. So, um, you know, five years ago, very much a product of last resort. We're seeing much more people using it as a way of taking control of, of their finances and those of their family. So the, the big increases, we've seen intergenerational wealth transfer. So uh, where people have children uh, in, in, in London and the average first time uh, house price is 400,000 and it's almost 40 years old before you can get onto the housing ladder. We're seeing the older generations releasing funds to, to pass down and actually get them onto the housing ladder sooner. We're seeing top up, top up of pensions and generating uh, an income. Um, and also, I mean, one of the, the you know, replacement of interest only mortgages. So people who've hit their kind of late 50s and don't have a vehicle to repay uh, for some of those people, that's, that's the, the, the better outcome for it. But the other, the other big one uh, that, that we're also starting to see people in uh, is actually use it to future proof their homes and actually from a quality of life perspective, stay independent for as long as possible. So releasing funds to amend their homes, uh, you know, to actually pay for care in the home to stay there and actually really just to make sure they have that buffer to be able to stay independent, which ultimately, for most people, is the kind of the biggest quality of life factor uh, in later life. I mean, that's a, that's a big point. You know, the ability to sort of, you know, insulate or guard their home yeah. rather than enter in, into some sort of yeah, managed, to, yeah. managed care. Yeah, yeah I mean, take, take away the, the kind of worry and things that may, you know, may cause worry. But, you know, beyond that, um, in terms of family members who are concerned with their independence, things like, you know, connected home type technologies, yeah. disaggregation of, of, of electricity sources so people can monitor to make sure the patterns are working and that 
their parents are, are kind of okay. Um, so th th there's a huge amount there. And actually, you know, as we move into the social care part of the conversation, the longer we can pe keep people in their own homes, and you know, then then it's less likely that the NHS or or oh, into yeah. care homes. I so. mean, do you, do you think actually that? Um, that LNG now and Santander have gone into this market. I mean, it was previously it was very small and was obviously yeah. regarded as rather uncompetitive. The rates were almost prohibitive, but the rates have come down dramatically. Do you think that's because yeah, that was all to do with our market entry? I mean, we, 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 we've got a 35% market share from a standing start of zero or two years ago. So it's, it's and it, and we view disruption as a privilege and a, and a responsibility in many many ways. And it took us a long time to figure out when was the right time to come in. And I would agree with everything that you, you, you've said. It's a three billion pound market. With proactive policy, it should be a 20 billion pound per annum market. And it would make a real dent on, on an improvement in the lives of many people. It's one of the, the highest customer satisfaction mm -hmm. product, products that's ever been created in financial services. And with multiple innovation going on, no pups, much more yes. competitively mm -hmm. priced than it's ever been in the history of it. And we, we, we have endless, really, really good solutions. And this is a advice-intensive product. You know, typically the advice costs <laughs> well over a thousand pounds at the moment, and can cost even more than that uh, for, for some people. But it's a really important decision. And it's, it's bizarrely, this is a decision where people were very welcoming of expert advice. Mm. The barrier is actually there's not enough people trained up to give that advice. So it's a, it, because we, we, we've got the demand is running well ahead of the supply. And the funds that are available, and if you think back to us looking after a trillion pounds, having a bit more of that in this area is, is a relatively trivial uh, amount for us as a, as a group. But this is going to be one of the most exciting areas in finance in the coming years. Mm, that's a, and that, will move, that moves us nicely on to the, the third area, talking about that, and uh, about um, social care or funding and long-term care and the role that markets can make in that. Now, we'll aware that the government has made a right hash of this, um, uh, but they're going to try and put it right. The Green Paper's coming out this late summer, probably July this year, the new Green Paper on long-term care. Nigel's uh, an advisor to, to that Green Paper. Andrew's uh, an advisor as well, so both right in there. Um, Andrew, do you want to talk about a little bit about what you think you would like to see in this Green Paper, what you think the important things are going to happen? and the role, if any, that financial markets can play in the solution. Yeah. So let me, um, let me try terribly quickly. Um, and there's a lot of confusion about long-term care. Long-term care looks to me much more like pensions did 150 years ago than like pensions do now. If you're a 35-year-old now, you can be pretty confident that you're going to reach retirement. So saving is the natural response. If you're a 35-year-old now, you can't be at all sure you'll need long-term care, or at least not much of it. Uh, Long-term care is heavily skewed, and most of us on current technology are not going to need much long-term care. So long-term care looks like an insurance issue, not a savings issue. The problem is that uh, trying to buy long-term care insurance is a bit like going to health insurance saying, I'd really like to buy health insurance, I'd like to buy it for 25 years from now. And they'll laugh at you because they don't know what the technology 25 years from now will be. And because of that, there isn't a long-term care insurance market anywhere in the world. Now, that's a tragedy because it means that people are left trying to self-insure against a rather unlikely outcome. So what we need is we somehow need to make that market work. How can we do it? I think the natural way is to get the state to take the, the tail-end risk because only the state will take it. But I don't think you should take all the risk. I think you should take the, the catastrophic bit of the risk and leave... Uh, the private sector then to provide products up to the up to wherever the state intervenes, but probably more importantly, and where I think there's more money around for uh, Nigel and Rogers businesses, is to provide top up. So I don't think that the private sector is realistically ever going to take the catastrophic risk. But if the state comes in and says, once you get to a certain point, we will come in, I think there is a role for the private sector in providing both cover up to that point and cover for people beyond that point who want something nicer than what the state will provide. And I think if we get to there, then I think there really is a market for, the, uh, I think there's a space for the private sector to come in. Uh, will, we, will we get the government across the line on this? Who knows? About three weeks ago, Jeremy Hunt gave a speech where he committed again to putting a cap in. What a cap means is 
social insurance with a large excess. So I, I think we might get there, but I don't think it's straightforward. And the reason it's not straightforward is it's going to cost some money, and raising taxes is not a popular thing to do. And then uh, what, what about the, the, the debate that's going on, this sort of between you know, the, the level of means testing, the amount of money that that's going to cost, because there's just a real shortage of care at the bottom end of the market, and this idea of putting this catastrophic insurance on at the cap at the top. And there's a lot of fight, I believe, within the government about exactly the balance there. There is, there is a fight, and my view is we have to do both. So any civilised society will provide social care for people who can't afford to do anything for themselves, and we're not doing enough of that at the moment. But unless we do something to where, where the government comes in and provides catastrophic risk insurance, then it's going to go on being very hard for the private sector to allow a market to develop where people can do more. So I, th I think we have to do both, and I think there's a growing recognition in politics that we need to do both. We're now in the unusual position that all three English main political parties are committed to doing this. Um, now, you'd think that will be enough to get us across the line, but actually we got across the line with the Social Care Act in 2014, which even got the Royal Assent. And in Politics 101, once you've got the Royal Assent, you're home and dry. Um, we weren't home and dry because about three months after the Royal Assent, uh, the new government in 2015 put it off for a few more years. So I think we can do this. I think we ought to. I think if we can, then this would be a, a classic example of an area where a combination of government action and the private sector financial services could do something really wonderful for people who at the moment are terrified of the big risk. And this is the big risk at the moment that everybody faces where there's nothing they can do about it. No, would you like to add anything on that? Yeah, I, I mean, Andrew and I agree, uh, sit on the panel together. But I, I sat on the patient capital review, and which re required convincing you know, Philip Hammond to put his hand in the pockets for several billion to help build a, a VC, a venture capital business in the UK, and to create startup money, seed money, um, whatever. And we, we're going to put loads of money in, in, into this. I think the auto enrollment's been a big success, again, with, with uh, collaboration going, going on. I think the lifetime mortgage, mm. you know, the meetings we've had with Jeremy Harewood and, and the, 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 the Prime Minister has sat in on two meetings personally with me on how, housing and all the things that could go on there. There's much higher engagement than it, and not superficial engagement, real engagement. And I think Andrew, Andrew's right. There is a solution, and again, it, it's academia, it's business, it's politics and finance all working together because the size of the problem just gets bigger the longer we, we take not to address, to address it. And um, the, if you can take out some of the tail risk, then I know we as a firm will do it because we, we've all, already in the laser like business, business mm. we manufacture houses, we take a modest amount of care risk around, around that, we have some digital, really interesting digital companies we own various percentages of which are providing services in, in this, this industry. And you know, lots of the old uh, uh, establishments just need knocking down and rebuilding in a totally modern way. And we've done that with one local authority where we've agreed to knock down nine and build build uh, three new ones which have a totally different cost base, much better technology and you know, the, you know, the fact is this is still only 10 years old and we're only at the very early stages of, of, of this and you know, my, my children are, are, are passionate about watching their dog on, on, the, on, on, on that. I'm hoping in years to come they'll be watching me on this and making sure that I'm alright all given all the kindness. I, I've got five children, five beautiful daughters. Um, <laughs> And, but the, 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 the technology has changed in such a profound way. You know, we can build you know, zero energy, zero carbon houses right, right now, tremendously economic, economically for all, the pe for all the people, and retain people in independent living for a lot, a lot more, and reduce the care costs massively uh, going, going forward. But only if we work in partnership and collaboration. Mm -hmm. And the, the real thing about politics going forward, we do need a much more collaborative mo model, which we had in the post-war period, in the 1945 period, when all my heroes from the various parties actually came up with real solutions. We need that again in the modern society. So all the things that some of the politicians say, we actually deliver on. Thank you. Uh, we're running out of time, very conscious of that. Uh, do we have any quick questions that you would like to fire at the panel? Uh, maybe I'll take a couple, couple, all at once, and then I'll give the, pa the panel a chance to answer, and we'll have to finish there. Thank you. Uh, Atul, this probably uh, touches on your point you've just made. And uh, uh, given where we are in the UK, uh, is there anything that we can learn from a country like Japan, which is actually facing the impact of aging as at this point in time? 
uh, what are the policy responses in Japan as at this point in time? And is there anything that can drive maybe future policy decisions in the UK? Okay, so that's nice. About Japan, what we can learn from other countries. Uh, do we have any? Oh, there's another. Is it Ravi at the back there? Uh, so thanks for a, a brilliant presentation, Darren, and then a great discussion after that. The depressing implication of all of this seems to be that some form of social provision is inevitable, uh, which means the taxes are going up, Corbyn or no Corbyn. Do you have a reaction to that? Okay, so I thought it was very positive, but Ravi thinks it's very, <laughs> very depressing. Um, so we've got any other comments we want to pick up? Okay, so do, what can we learn from other countries and do we find it depressing that we're going to have to have higher taxes? Right, so those are the two questions. So I, I don't think it's at all depressing. Um, I think we, we, we have to recognise there are some things that are better done collectively and some of those things are, better done, are well done collectively through uh, private sector financial services. So our, our car insurance business, our house insurance business, I think our pension business. A lot of that has been extraordinarily effective, but often where it's most effective is after some collective intervention. So if our car insurance business works because it's illegal not to have car insurance. Our pension industry works because we've got a, a very substantial substructure of state intervention, which means that there's a, something that the private sector do. So I don't think we should be depressed about that. Um, it's not obvious that taxes overall have to rise because the state does lots of things and not all of them will get more expensive. So I, I think recognising collaboration between the individual and the state, I, I think that's fine. What can we learn from the rest of the world? That there is no silver bullet. Um, but that uh, there's nowhere which has managed to tackle any of these issues, housing, ageing and pensions or long-term care, without a collaboration between the individual, the state, and the private sector, and, and that's what we're going to need to make it work. Okay, right, so we're social democrats up here. Uh, do either of you two want to say what? Yeah, in Japan, the average person retires now at 73, and we've seen that as a, you know, so they've, they've compensated by working longer, and getting people to work longer has lots of benefits, particularly if they've got, uh, you know, suitable accommodation to live in. And, you know, I'm, I'm rather like Andrew. We're coming up with tremendously innovative solutions to all of these, these, these problems uh, that we've got. And we always go into every meeting with the government saying, we do not need any money. We don't want you to raise taxes. We don't want you to do anything. We, we just want you to nudge, going back to the old-fashioned nudge, and help from a policy point of view to come up with a solution, which is mainly, mainly one that we're, we're capable of d delivering on, because science and technology is the most exciting it's ever been since sort of the 1850s, in my, in, in my view. There's just amazing things going on. We've got to figure out how we utilize all of that to the benefit of, of customers. And if we can do that, then we can develop really successful uh, business models, and that's what we're really interested in doing, is, is you know, being economically and socially useful as a, as a firm, and we have an, an amazing opportunity to do that, and we're doing the best job that we possibly can in doing that right now, and we'll continue to do so. Okay, well, I wish we had more time. It's come to the end, it's come to drinks. So, <laughs> if, we, if we can thank the panellists for their Just time.